1998. The music. Uh, pretty sick. Fashion. Uh, yeah, we had it. The World Cup happened. Fucking Tamaguchis were a thing. You had a little pet inside of a thing. Oh, you gotta feed it. Gotta make sure it's sleep. Oh, it died. Dad, get the toothpicks. Because you have to reset it with a with a toothpick. Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Are you fucking kidding me? That cat, Salem, hilarious. But if you ask me, all of those things kind of pale in comparison to what I think is the most important event of 1998. That being the release of Windows Memphis. Well, hold on a second, Windows Memphis? I never even heard of Windows Memphis. No, of course you haven't, you fucking normie, because they changed its name prior to release to Windows 98. Now, Windows 98 had a bunch of cool shit going for it that wasn't available before, like a multi-monitor support. The file allocation table 32, also known as FAT32, to make the most out of your computer's memory or some shit. I honestly don't know, I'm not a fucking nerd. And support for the growing in popularity format of the digital video disc. That's right, DVD. Yeah, fucking, you gotta check out the commentary track for fucking Fight Club, dude. But perhaps most importantly, Windows 98 also came with a more streamlined and efficient version of everyone's favorite browser, Internet Explorer. Now listen up, Fortnite gamers, you were too young to remember this, but I'll tell you all about it. The internet was like super different back then, but don't take my word for it. Actually, in general, never trust a man with a mustache. But according to this study from Pew Research Center, only about 41% of adults regularly went online in 1998. And these numbers are still noticeably higher than previous years. 36% in 1997 and a measly 23% in 1996. Fucking look at this guy, 23%? Give me all your V-Bucks, you little loser, your little default skin wearing motherfucker. What I'm trying to say is that using the internet for everyday tasks was still not within the norm at this point. Now let's put this landscape, this digital landscape here into perspective. Yahoo had been around since all the way back in January of 1994, but Google won't even be a thing until September of 1998. The world hasn't even seen Neopets at this point. It's, it's a whole other world. I can't, I can't imagine it for all the fucking Neopets we forgot to feed and just never logged into again. They've been like, hey, Michael, where are you? This goes out to you, Michael. Why did you kill your pet? What's wrong with you, Michael? Now you're probably wondering what this has to do with the title of the video, Blair Witch Project, and I'm getting to it, but first, a little bit of a hypothetical here. It's about 1998, okay? The year I've been fucking referring to this entire video. You're in your uh, late teens, early 20s, and you know, you'll have to use your imagination here, okay? So here's you. Is that a fair representation? Okay. So you're in your room, the buzzing of your CRT monitor, the clicky clacky of your fucking Model M keyboard or whatever. It's late, your eyes are kind of straining in the dark towards the bright glow of your monitor, the little fucking critters, what are those, hippie hoppers, the one that goes those are outside making a bunch of noise, okay? You're online and you're making your way through a bunch of different brightly colored GeoCities websites, failed online dating services, shady Craigslist postings, when you somehow stumble upon a website. Now this website contains a scanned flyer signed by the Frederick County Sheriff's Office. And they're urging you or anyone to reach out to them with any information you might have regarding three missing college students. Heather Donahue, Joshua Leonard, and Michael Williams. You keep digging and you find out that they were classmates studying filmmaking together and that all three of them went missing while filming a documentary project. You also find that this website hasn't always been this sort of bulletin board for the police to learn information about them. No, this was a production site. This was like the project site for the documentary they were making. And this documentary, and this is the title of the video and we're getting to why it says sound down there, is the Blair Witch Project. Okay, cool. I feel like I've set the scene. So basically, if you haven't gathered it yet, I'm gonna be talking about the Blair Witch Project, but I'm not gonna be talking about the whole like underground marketing campaign because a lot of people have already done that and I don't know what this means. Instead, I'm gonna be focusing on a small detail in this film that always stood out to me as being so fucking cool and spooky, scary. And uh, I've never seen anyone talk about it, so that's what I'm gonna do, and I hope you stick around to listen to it, even if I sometimes get a little bit long-winded. Now I'm gonna start with recapping the Bywitch project, so if you haven't seen it before, please go watch it, or don't, you can stay and just watch this video, but I'm gonna spoil all of it, and it's a good movie, so I, you know, it's, 
your choice. But if you have seen it or if you don't care, here we go. This is your last warning. Let's begin. The Blair Witch Project in, I guess, two minutes or less. Student filmmakers Heather, Michael and Joshua are making a documentary about the legend of the Blair Witch. At their disposal, they are wielding a 16mm film camera, a DAT recorder and a Hi8 camcorder. After interviewing some locals and getting conflicting statements on the witch and its origins, they head out into the woods, planning to spend two nights there in a tent. They pretty much immediately get lost and then they start fighting. And they fight, like, a lot. They, they fight so much in this film. Then they find some creepy rock piles, some creepy stick men, some creepy shaky camera footage, and two nights turns into, I guess, more than two nights. I don't remember exactly how many nights they're out there. I saw it, like, yesterday, but I st still don't know how many nights it was. Three? Four? At night they hear sounds of twigs breaking and children outside of their tent. One night their tents get completely shooketh by beings unknown, and another night Josh just fully disappears without a trace and doesn't come back for the remainder of the film. Mike and Heather presses on trying to find their way out of the woods, but the next night they hear Josh screaming for help in the middle of the woods, so they go looking for him and they stumble upon an old house. Josh's voice seems to be coming from inside of the house, so they go in. And first they look around on the ground floor trying to pinpoint where Josh's voice is coming from. They then go to the top floor thinking it's coming from there, but it isn't. Huge galaxy brain Mike figures that he must be down in the basement, so he runs down there, leaving Heather alone. Upon entering the basement, Mike pretty immediately gets got. Heather, in the meanwhile, is heading downstairs, where she finds Mike facing the corner of the room, mirroring one of the statements from the beginning of the film, and then Heather gets got as well, and the movie ends. And that's the whole film. Now, The Blair Witch Project has a bunch of deep lore that you can look into, an accompanying made-for-TV mockumentary, a sequel, a remake, a bunch of stuff, and all of this expanded universe shit has spawned a bunch of different interpretations of what actually happens there at the end. Some, for example, claim for sure that the camera looks like it's filming from way higher up than the length of Heather, so that it's actually not Heather at the end there. The screams we can hear from her are or just because something's like dragging her along or something. Personally, I don't really care for the extended universe stuff. I'm gonna go off the assumption that it is Heather holding the camera at the end there. If nothing else, then if the police were the ones to like cut this film together, why would they cut to the other camera while some of the most important stuff is happening on the other one? Like, why would they choose to have the footage of just like a floor while something super interesting and important to the case is happening to Heather? But all of this is kind of relevant to the point that I'm gonna make, and yes, I'm still getting to it. There's just one more tiny little thing that we still have to go through before I can get to my point so let's just get this over with and uh, and then 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 we'll go ahead okay so backtracking just a little bit to the recap I mentioned something that is gonna be kind of important for this namely the gear that they are using so to reiterate they have a 16 millimeter film camera a DAT recorder and a high 8 camcorder Let's break those down real quick. The 16mm film camera is a black and white camera that, as the name suggests, shoots on film. Now something to note about 16mm cameras is that they don't have an onboard microphone most of the time. They have a loud motor noise, you know this? that goes in the background the entire time. So when filming on one of these bad boys, you would use an external recorder. Which brings us to the DAT recorder. DAT stands for Digital Audio Tape, but that doesn't really matter. We don't have to dwell deep into this one, just think of it as an audio recorder. This doesn't record audio, but this does, so you take the audio from this and the images from this and you match them up in editing, it's magic, okay? Let's move on to the last one, the Hi8 camcorder. This is exactly the kind of camera that you picture in your head if you're like 20 something and you hear the word camcorder. It has a zoom rocker, a built-in microphone, little light attachment, and everything filmed with it will be in poorer quality than if it was filmed with a 16 millimeter, but it will have color and audio. The majority of the film is seen through the eyes of this camera. Okay, that's it. That's all the technical stuff. You did it. You made it. You're through the hardest part. Now, at the end of the Blair Witch Project, Mike and Heather enter the house both yielding a camera. Mike is using the Hi8 camcorder, and Heather is using the 16mm. Note that the DAT recorder is not rolling. They go to check out the top floor together before Mike rushes off to the basement. And this is where things get really interesting. So Mike has the camcorder, meaning the only source of sound in this scene. As he rushes down the stairs, we can naturally hear him get further and further away from Heather, who is still upstairs. He enters the basement, something happens that we don't get to see, and the camera falls to the floor. Now this creates a scenario so unique with such a specific kind of using your technical limitations to your advantage that it's been etched into my mind ever since I first saw the movie. 
So after Mike's camera fall to the floor, we cut to Heather and the 16 mil. Again, this camera has no audio recording feature, so this scene or this clip, I guess, would be completely silent if it weren't for the fact that Mike's camera is still on the floor in the basement and it's still recording. This essentially means that we have the audio from the basement, but we have the visuals from Heather's point of view. As Heather moves down the stairs, we can hear her scream for Mike, but only faintly. Now I guess I'm gonna become a little bit personal here. Um, as someone who's dealt with a lot of anxiety and like disassociation, this scene like immediately reminded me of those feelings. It's like an out of body experience almost. It's like a dream where your mind kind of disconnects from your body um, or that like when you've laid down and you get up too fast and your vision starts to kind of fade and you have that ringing in your ears and it's like the world around you is just like kind of blurring out but you're still like in full control in your head and it's uh, yeah, it's a weird experience. I don't know if that's maybe just for me that it feels like that, but it do be like that for me. And now maybe because of those very subjective experiences or because the film has just very skillfully slowly put me into the shoes of Heather, this is the moment in the film where I feel the closest to Heather while also feeling more distanced from her than in any other scene. Now a lot of people don't like found footage movies and I totally get that. Personally, I love them and I feel like one of the strengths to the format or the genre if you want to call it that is the closeness that you get to the characters. You can hear them breathe, stumble their words and you're basically seeing everything through their eyes. When they suddenly swing around because a twig broke or there's a spooky noise or something, it's not just them that's spinning around, it's the entire audience. It's me or you, I guess. This paired with the fact that you most often can't see the main protagonist's face a lot, so you kind of lose that connection of being able to read their face and their emotions, really leaves you isolated uh, with no indication of what you're like supposed to be feeling. Instead, you're just there to feel and watch, I guess. Like when it's done right, you are there with them, like in the scene. Uh, practically able to feel the ground beneath your feet, hear the rustling of the leaves. But still it's this weird dissonance because you still obviously can't affect what's going on. You're still just an observer. It's like as much as it includes you and drags you in and forces you to watch, it also excludes you from being able to interact with the world that you are now in, basically. And that powerlessness is exactly what I think they nail so well at the end of the Blair Witch Project. Like, I'm in there with Mike and Heather, I'm in the spooky house, and then until I'm suddenly not anymore, because I do the sound thing, and suddenly it's like I've lost one of my senses. It's like everything that I, the audience, and the film agreed upon is like, this is the contract of, the, hello, this is how the movie is gonna work. That is all just blown out the window. Every established premise of the format, we just seeing this through like a handheld camera's eyes, is gone. They pull the rug out from under our feet and we have been robbed of, I don't know, half of our senses it feels like. And I'm saying half because we're not fully deaf. We can still hear something. It's just that we can't hear it in the way that we've learned to hear it. We can't hear Heather's breath. We can't hear her clothes rustling, uh, her handling noises of the camera. All that's gone. You can just hear her screaming like far away. And for me, this is when it really hit me because this is when I realized that her screams are getting closer. Obviously I knew she was going to the basement, like I kind of figured she would be, but it's not until now that I realize what's going on. The camcorder on the floor in the basement has basically become sort of a sonar. Every time Heather screams, we can hear it a little bit clearer. And as good as that feeling is of being able to regain some of our senses, we know that for each decibel the audio goes up, for each tiny increment of increased quality in Heather's voice, we know that she is getting one step closer to whatever it was that got Mike. We, the audience, suddenly have a way of telling just how far Heather is from what is most likely her death. And the worst part is that we can't do anything about it. We can't tell her, we can just sit there and watch. And listen, I guess. Now, this scene only lasts like a couple of seconds, not even a minute. It's kind of a blink it and you'll miss it thing. And I have no doubts in my mind that a lot of people who've seen this film didn't even reflect over the fact that the audio seems to be coming from somewhere else or what that kind of does to you when you're looking at it. It's seemingly such a small, inconsequential choice, 
Except that it really isn't. Personally, I feel like it's the most important creative choice that the directors took for the entire film. Now, The Blair Witch Project is one of the least technically impressive films to have ever broken any sort of box office records. Like, when doing research for this script, uh, this blew my mind. Apparently this film is not mixed in Dolby 5.1 surround, the thing that every movie is fucking mixed in. It's just mixed in stereo. It's just two audio tracks, one left, one right. And that just makes it even more impressive how fucking effective this is. Effectively, it's taken a scene that in and of itself would have been scary with, you know, spooky house in the middle of the forest and everything. But then adding on this extra layer of just, I don't know, like a fucking sherry on top of the whole thing. And to me, that's why this is one of the most horrifying, terrible, scary, spooky scenes of any horror film of all time. <sighs> Thank you so much for watching this entire thing. Uh, maybe you're wondering who the fuck I am or what the fuck this channel is. Maybe you're super confused. So, uh, I'm Jeff. This channel used to be called 10 Tapes and it used to host my ARG 10 Tapes. Um, but it's not here anymore. It is on another channel. It, the show's over, by the way. Um, and uh, that channel is called 10 Tapes Archive. I'll have it linked up in the thing in the corner if I figure out how to do that. If not, it's gonna be down in the, in the description. I'm not done with creating ARGs. There's gonna be more things like that, but also I'm passionate about <laughs> a bunch of things and movies and video games and music. And I wanna talk about them. And uh, yeah, I wanna try this whole thing. Uh, it's weird and scary to try something new. So if you've watched this far, I'm super, super thankful for that. Um, I do have a Patreon. These names here are the people who are supporting me right now and I'm super grateful for them. Without them, I uh, wouldn't have been able to set this green screen up and these IKEA lights and yeah, it's a janky setup. Uh, you know, hopefully, maybe in the future, the production value will go up a little bit more. But yeah, thank you so much for watching this far if you have. Um, do all the YouTube stuff. This is my first video, I don't know what to say. Uh, except repeat what I've heard everywhere else. You know, hit the like and smash this fucking <laughs> subscribe button and I, I, I don't know. Maybe send this video to a friend uh, or someone you hate or your dad. Uh, as you can tell by the view counter down here somewhere, there's probably not a, like a very big number on this, so uh, you'd really be helping me out. But if nothing else, I'm just glad you watched. And uh, yeah, consider the Patreon. There's uh, the fucking Discord as well. A good place to keep up with upcoming ARGs, YouTube stuff. I do Twitch a bit, and yeah. Damn, this is gonna be hell to edit. This camera like overheats um, every five minutes, so it's taken me like three or four hours to film this whole thing, so I don't even know if it's gonna go together. Oh, this is how the living room looks, in case I haven't cut to that at any point earlier. And this is a tired little kitty named horse say hello hey like this video and subscribe and pay me 200 dollars on patreon if you like cats <laughs> i'll talk to you in the next one i'm sorry did i wake you up yes yes i'm sorry hey so tired kitty ow don't bite me